Well, I've got uh, just a, a little bit shorter of a message for you today. Um, I just want to talk about testimony. I want to talk about that a little bit, just maybe to encourage you. And thank you, Emma. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Paxson and Savannah, for coming on up here. It's just good to hear from the body. And I know others of you, you have a, a testimony. If you, if you feel like the Lord is prompting you to share your testimony, please reach out to me. I would love to, to know that. You can email me, uh, message me, tell me face-to-face, whatever. But I, I would love to hear from you. If you've got something that you want to share with the body, it's important. So please, please don't hesitate to let me know. But I would like for every believer, you've heard me say this, and I'm going to say this from time to time, I would like for every believer at Revived Church to know their testimony. I would like for every single one of you if, you, if you've never thought about that, never thought about sharing your testimony, or if you have one, you do have one. If you're following Him, if you, if you put your trust and faith in Him, you, you have a testimony. And it, it's my hope as your pastor that you'll have not only know your testimony, but, but have opportunity to share your testimony and I've talked about that before, that, that some, of you, some of you may stand in front of the assembly. Some of you might stand in front of hundreds, dozens, maybe thousands. I don't know. Some of you will sit across a table from somebody and share your testimony. And I guarantee you, in the kingdom of God, any of those is just as powerful. And so that's why I think it's incredibly important that you know your story, that you know your journey that you're aware of it. And, and if you are struggling with that, with writing it down, um, with, with Jody Cowden's help, we, we fashioned a worksheet that you can use to, um, to go through and really kind of write out some aspects of your story and then how to, to get that dialed into a testimony. And some of you, you can, you can start speaking that in your car, hearing yourself share that, but we want that. My goal for my own life is to grow. And my hope as your pastor is that you grow and that you come, you know, Sunday after Sunday and that you have an opportunity to grow, that you're taking this seriously, the fellowship, the bonding, the relationship, not just with each other, but with the Lord and a new relationship with yourself. That's incredibly important too. But our vision together for Revive is that we grow together. We're not just a bunch of individuals. We're, we're a body. We're together. And we want to grow as a church together this way. But your testimony is likely to involve some growing, some pruning, and some, some learning lessons on your journey. And I, I just want to share a couple of words about that. And I do want to try to end so that we, we have a little bit of extra time. You can visit with one another, but so that we can also tear down and, and get out to the baptisms here today. But some of you have been walking with the Lord for a long time. And you can testify that in that long journey with the Lord, there have been some easy times and some good times, but, but you're always going through it. But what's the, what's the thing? God wants to grow you. He wants more relationship out of you, or with you. And so it doesn't matter how how new or how mature you are in that journey, it's always going to keep continuing. It's always going to keep going. It's always going to keep growing. You, you really haven't arrived. You, you won't, you'll arrive when you arrive. Amen. Amen? But I want to read four verses to you, and I want you to write these down. If you've got your sermon journal or you've got your phone, a place to take notes, I want you to write these four verses down. These are familiar, but I want you to look at this as kind of like a process. If I've got time, I'm going to come back to them in a minute. But the first one, so my hope is to share each one of these twice. 2 Corinthians 5.17, this is familiar to so many of you. I shared this just, just recently, and this also was the, the, the key verse at, at Steve's funeral that we did a few weeks ago. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Get this in your heart. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are a new creation. Think about that. In Jesus, planted, rooted in Him, pruned, getting ready. In this next passage, 
in its original context was, was given to the children of Israel by the Lord through the prophet Ezekiel. And God didn't do this because they were good, but because He is good. But He wants us to be attentive to Him and to live according to who we are in Him. So Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, a verse, grab a hold of this today. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I love this verse. Jesus changes lives. And you know that when I stand up here and I read something out of the Old Testament and the word heart is involved. Hebrew, the word is lev. Lev, it's your mind and your heart. So I always want you to look at it this way because for you it might change what this means a bit. Do you think or feel or know? Or it's not the heart as we would see it, where most of our, our feeling would come from. This involves the mind where our thinking comes from. And so when he says, I'll give you a new heart, you can just as well say he's going to give you a new mind. And that heart of stone, sometimes like Israel, how many times those of you who've read through the Bible enough to say, wow, I'm a lot like Israel. Anybody, anybody ever conclude that? And you just realize, I'm a lot like those people. You might be reading and going, dang, those people. And then you realize, I am those people. Hard-headed, stubborn, resistant, and rebellious. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Been there? Yeah, hello. But when he's saying he's going to give a, a, a heart of flesh in place of a heart of stone, think about a hard-headedness, like a stone. And he wants to soften that. When David said in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, what he's saying is, Create in me a clean mind. You ever gone through a time where you just think your mind is so muddy, your thoughts are so muddy, it needs a, a little rinse? You need to go through the washer and get that shaken out. You need a cleaning there. Create in me a clean mind, oh God. Next verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Really, if you just look at the Greek, it'd, it'd be just, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, and I got that highlighted, you can see that, then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Listen to this, and I, and I say this, you know, I've said this throughout the year. Do not identify with or take the shape of this world or this age, this time that we live in, but take the shape of Jesus in your thinking. Take the shape of Jesus in your thinking, in your mind, in your head, in your heart, all of this. Do not identify with the shape of this world or the age we live in. There is a new shape. Okay? But it says then, that's the moment. Then you will be able. Now you're ready to see clearly the things of God. You will be able to test and to prove. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. It says, now, and this is what we're going to wrap this up with this thought. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. If he started it, he's going to finish it. Amen? Amen. So do you see the process in all of these things? If he started it, he's going to finish. Say out loud, Jesus, finish what you started. Jesus, finish what you started. Even if it's not easy. Some of you are like, Pastor Bob, you trapped me in that. <laughs> Maybe a little. Right thinking leads to right acting. And we, we got to get something changed sometimes. And sometimes we're hard-headed. Sometimes we're resistant. But I just want to touch on something because we're all on a journey. And I'm touching on this because it's something that comes my way. Something that I see. Something that I observe. But I, I, I want to share a broad illustration with you. 
okay? We live our lives. We go through changes. We grow. Sometimes we move from Minnesota to South Africa. Sometimes we just move across the street. And sometimes both of those things can be hard. We don't know. But we have to trust God in all of it. But when Israel was in Egypt, the people had access to the fertile soil in the waters of the Nile. Can you just imagine that? Again, it's a broad illustration here. Egyptian gods were associated with the river, the sun, fertility, all of these things. And numerous gods. So think about the, you know, from a large perspective where Israel was at one point. The children of Israel would have been familiar and probably even worshipped the gods of Egypt while they were there. Remember, they were there over 400 years. So they have gotten involved, to say the least. But I want you to see a metaphor here. We were once in this world, in Egypt of sorts, okay? You being called out of that. You were in an Egypt of sorts. And you knew... The, the world's ways, and you're still aware of all of those ways of the world, right? I'm aware of a lot of the ways of the world. There's a lot of things I'm not aware of anymore, but I have a good memory of the things of where I came from, and I can still see. It's kind of like when Israel came out, they still were surrounded by nations and people and lands and all of these things. It all affected them. But when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, everything changed. And when we come out of the world, when we come out of the world's system, out of the world's thinking, we have to change too. For instance, uh, using the idea of the Nile, the water that they relied on, the, the, what they were used to in Egypt, they could see it, it flowed, they might have fished in it, bathed in it, all of it, it flooded, it was plentiful, stuff grew around it, it was fertile. There was probably, think about this, an expectation of, of the flow of, of the river. You just knew it was going to be there, right? Does anybody expect that Forest Lake is going to dry up in the next 24 hours? How about even in the next 24 years? You, you probably wouldn't expect that. You're just taking it for granted. It's going to be there, right? Your lakeshore, if you've got lakeshore property, God bless you, that's awesome. Your lakeshore property, it's probably, you're taking it for granted. It's just going to be there, right? Imagine that. There could be drought from time to time, but basically this was their life. Last week, I used a, a place called Gamla as a metaphor. You can watch that uh, on, you, on our YouTube channel or on our Revive app and, and take a look at that message. But like the water that flows, think about where they were, the water that flows, it's plentiful, it's natural, it's predictable. Things are growing and flourishing. And you might be in a time like that in your life right now. You might be in a time that it's just, wow, this is incredible. The fountain is just flowing and stuff. It, it's easy. It's just all coming to me. I love this life. Some of you are there. Some of you are going, I wish I had that. I get it. Maybe you are there or you've been in a time like that. You can identify with good and easy times. I've been in times like that. I've had times like that taken away from me too. Or I've moved from times like that. Everything seems natural, it's predictable, I feel secure, it's going in the right direction. You just hope this never changes. But what if God allowed or allows your circumstance to change? You might be in a time of change right now. You might be carrying your bags, so to speak, and you're moving from one place to another, and you're uncertain. And I know some of you are in a spot like that. You're just uncertain right now of what is happening. What's going on? And you think everything's just falling apart. But maybe from the Lord's perspective, everything's just falling into place. You see that? It's all about our mindset, isn't it? Maybe you need to just close your eyes right now and just... just, just Put that on your heart, Lord, things 
Maybe I think things are falling apart, but for you, maybe things are falling into place. I'm just going to trust you. But what would happen if that flowing river that you're used to were to begin to dry up a bit? What would happen? Would you start to curse God? Would you start to grumble? Would you start to have a problem with all of that? I think in the natural, we would, right? In the flesh, we would. We'd be like, what in the world is going on? My whole life is being disrupted. Maybe. But what if your new physical or spiritual location, it isn't quite the same as where you once were, and you were used to depending on yourself or the world in some way, things that you took for granted. The river flows, the rain falls, but God is saying to you, I want you to know that it's me. I want you to know that it's me. I want you to fully rely on me. And so in this new land, in this new time, Israel had to rely on what? Not themselves and not the river flowing, but they had to rely on the hand of heaven now to provide for what they needed. Think about that. Maybe God in your life wants you now to shift into a time where you really have to rely on the hand of heaven for what He wants you to have. Manna, children of Israel, what are we going to eat? Where did the manna come from? Did it come from a rock or did it come from above? Water came from above. They came from a, a, a place where the water was all flowing. Now it had to rain. Pretty incredible. Or it had to come from a rock, but God had to be the supply, right? Meat, even meat, where did it come from? From above. Even their protection came from above. So I'm asking you the question, what have you been taking for, uh, taking for granted in your life? Because God wants you to know that it's Him. So let's shift our thinking. Let's change something. But Israel was brought to a place where they had to give up their old reliances and learn to rely on God alone. And it wasn't easy. Do you see that? Those of you who have read through the Old Testament, do you see that? That they had to give up those old reliances. And you might feel like that's you right now. And I don't want you to think, and this is important, I don't want you to sit there thinking, especially if you're new in your faith, God must be angry with me. He's not. Don't think God is angry with you. He loves you. Does He want you to stay in the thinking that you have? No. He wants to move you. He wants to progress you. All right? You might be thinking, well, He doesn't want me to have nice things. Well, sure He does. He just doesn't want those nice things to control you or to possess you. He wants that spot in your life or that he's lost interest in you or he just doesn't love you anymore but remember he loves you he just doesn't want you to stay where you are your heart and your mind are his biggest concern last week i talked about shade and maybe you've been in uh maybe you've been in the shade maybe he's saying you're done in the shade you need to move on maybe you've been out in the sun the sun of life, it's scorching, it's, it's burning, and you need to get into some shade. Like Todd, I love that testimony. Psalm 91.1, it says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High, I will, uh, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. We need to dwell in Him. God wants to be your all in all. He even wants to be your shade, your shelter, and your protection. And He wants you, me, all of us together to rely on Him. And I think what we have is we, we have a day and time where we are so inundated with technology. We have so many things that just take care of us. Do you know that in your house, you don't even have, if you have a thermostat, do you know that your thermostat does what people used to do manually? Your thermostat just goes, oh, it's time, to, uh, it's time to turn it on because the people who live in this house need a 6.30 warm-up and I'm just going to do that for you. Do, you. do you understand what I'm saying? Do you give God thanks for the thermostat? I need to now that I bring it up. It's like, you need to give God thanks for your... Thank you, Lord. I'm going to thank you for the thermostat. 
I even have an app on my phone. I can sit on my couch and go, it's a little warm in here. I just dial it back a minute and it kicks on. Thank you, Lord, for the app so I didn't have to get my butt off the couch and go do something manually, God forbid. (laughs) That's the world we live in. Okay? I know some of you out there splitting wood. Nice pile of wood, by the way, John. I saw it. Really, really impressive. Do you know what I do? I sit on my couch with my app and I just go, just like this. It heats the house up. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> God wants to be your shelter and your shade. And he wants you to realize that it's Him. Amen. Amen? All right. When we need our heart worked on, He's actually going to change something that causes us to focus on our heart, our mind, our thinking. Don't be stubborn to that. I just wanted to to get you into that. But I want to look at these scriptures again. Let's look at them real quick. One more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is is here. And the first thing we need to say is hallelujah. Hallelujah to that. But I have a couple of questions. Okay, I'm going to try to to breeze through these because I want to get through these. The first one is, will I submit to allowing Jesus to change me, to challenge me, to grow me? And don't say to yourself, I've walked with the Lord a long time. I'm super mature and I've got this. He is not done. He's not done. Just when you thought you had some reprieve, he's not done. Do I really want to be in Jesus? All right. This isn't something like a buffet. You don't get to pick the parts of Jesus you want to you wanna have. It's not the Jesus old country buffet. I mean, we should want Him all, right? Am I willing to submit to His process, His way? Am I willing to let Him repot, which means relocate, and prune me, which means do some trimming? Am I willing to let Him do that? Some scholars say that not all of the children of, uh, of Israel wanted to leave Egypt, that maybe some stayed. I've read that. I'm not positive about that, but it's interesting to me to think about that. But perhaps some chose to remain in slavery and not follow the God of Moses. I want the new thing, a new me. I just don't know what it's going to be like giving up the old thing and the old me. Anybody ever say that? I want the new thing, I just don't know. I want to leave Egypt because I don't like being told what to do, but I like the food. This is how we are. This is the way we are, kind of as people. There are things I need, I know I need to let go of, but there are a few things I really don't want to let go of. Let's look at Ezekiel 36, 26 again. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, I will remove from you your hard-heartedness, your stubbornness, your rebelliousness, and give you a heart of flesh, a mind of flesh. And so a question I'm asking you, do you want that? Do you want that? You might think, yeah, I, I want this, but what do you mean by remove? Will it hurt? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little tug, you know? You're going you're gonna to feel it. So a question, do we want the product but not the process? Do we want the product but not the process? I want the finished product. I don't want to go through what it takes to get that. Romans 12.2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So a question, am I ready to stand out? Am I ready to go against the grain of this world? Because that's what it means when you follow Jesus. Do you know, news alert, that Jesus is going this way and the world is going this way? They're not going in the same direction. Have you seen that? Anybody aware of that? They're like, sometimes, boom, they're just not even going in different directions. They're completely opposed Am I ready to stand out and go against the grain of this world? Am I ready to be a different shape than what I was because I'm not going to fit where I used to fit? 
Am I ready to leave where I am to get where I'm supposed to be? Am I ready to have the mark of Christ on me? And the last question that I have, and I think it's a, it's a hard one, am I willing to allow God to be God even of my comfort and let Him lead me? I mean, when we're, when we're comfortable, when we're settled in, we're saying to, to the world, don't you mess with my cozy spot. And we all kind of got one, don't we? We all kind of have a cozy spot. And we're saying, please Jesus, don't mess with my cozy spot. I'm kind of settled in here. So do we sometimes want the destination without the journey? I think we do. We might have to walk on some rocks and search for some shade. And remember this. Israel once was a barren wasteland, a desert wasteland for centuries. It was dry and fruitless, and there were very few trees. And sometimes our lives can be kind of like this. We can feel like it's dry and fruitless. It was hard, incredibly hard, but the land of Israel began to blossom again. It is the miracle of our day, and it's the fulfillment of prophecy. We're going to close up here, but listen to what Mark Twain said in, in 1867. Riding on horseback through the Jezreel Valley, which today is fertile and beautiful. I mean, you see it today. It is gorgeous, blooming, fertile, prosperous. He said there is not a solitary village throughout its whole extent, not for 30 miles in any direction. There are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. One may ride in 10 miles hereabouts and not see 10 human beings. He said of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. Can the curse of the deity beautify a land? Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. Over it broods the spell of a curse that has withered its fields and fettered its energies. Israel is no longer a land like this. Israel is blossoming and it's growing and it's beautiful. That's a testimony and it didn't happen overnight and your life is like that. It's a testimony and it's not going to happen overnight. You might feel like there's a desert barren wasteland. You are not where you once were. And God is doing amazing and beautiful and wonderful things. And I'm asking you to consider trusting the process, even if it means being repotted, replanting, going across the street. Amen. Would you stand? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want you to hang in there. Hang in there. You have a testimony. Follow Jesus. Let Him do what He's got to do. Be on the same course as Him. Go with Him. Heavenly Father, we just give You thanks for this day. We give You thanks for the testimony that we've heard today and testimonies that we've heard recently. Because You are not finished with us. You are doing a good and amazing work, Lord. So we give ourselves to You today. Even whispering, maybe some here in this place are saying, Jesus, you can have me. Maybe some of you are going to say, Jesus, you can have more of me. Some of you are saying, ah, Jesus, you can have all of me. I'm done trying to do this by myself. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the good work that, that he has started, he is going to see to completion. But we thank you, Lord, and we love you. We worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen.